Hello everyone, Blendini here with some quick tips addressing common issues with animating curves, rigid body simulations, and combining the two. This is a follow-up to a conveyor belt tutorial where we made this animation. But don't worry, you don't need to have seen that tutorial to take advantage of these tips. First up, curve tips. Curves modifier tip number one, unexpected object placement. All right, here I have an object, this car, and I want it to ride along this curve using the curve modifier. So I'll select the object and apply the curve modifier, and then I'll select the curve. But I get this unexpected result with the car way over here, distorted away from the curve. Know that when using the curve modifier, the object origin for the curve and the object should be co-located in the same place. We can ensure this easily by selecting both objects, going to Object, Snap, and selecting Selection to Active. Now we can repeat all the same steps to apply the curve modifier. And moving the car along the x-axis will move it along the curve. Curves modifier tip number two, unexpected scale changes. Here's another basic array. Let's add a curve and scale it way up. Notice we're still in object mode. Now let's go back to the array and add a curve modifier. Select the curve and everything works as we expected. But notice the curve scale has been increased more than 12 times. We apply the scale transformation and then chaos happens with our array. When we apply a transformation to a curve, the transformation affects the curve radius, which we can see in edit mode by tabbing into edit with the curve selected. All we have to do to fix this is reset the curve's mean radius to one, and the problem is solved. This can also be addressed by transforming the curve in edit mode, which does not modify the curve's mean radius, and in turn, doesn't affect the scale of the object the curve is applied to. Curves modifier tip number three, understanding the deform axis. We'll use this curve and monkey object. The default deform axis is X, and what that means is that the X axis of the object will be the axis that deforms along the curve. From top view, we can clearly see the X axis goes side to side as if passing through the monkey's ears. This means when we enable the curve modifier, the monkey head will be oriented in such a way that the X axis of the object rides along the curve like a train along its tracks and moving the object along this axis moves the object along the curve regardless of the curve's orientation. Moving the monkey along the x-axis moves it up or down the curve. The deformations you see here on the monkey head result from the entire mesh being deformed to fit the curve. With the deformation axis being positive moving the monkey in the positive x direction moves it forward along the curve, while negative transformations along the x-axis move it backwards along the curve. The y-axis passes through the monkey's head from front to back. Selecting this as the deformation axis moves the monkey head accordingly along the curve. Selecting the negative axis changes the orientation 180 degrees. The object faces the other way, and negative movements move it forward, while positive transformations along the axis will move it backwards along the curve. The same is true for the z-axis. But what if we wanted the object to face a different direction? Like what if we wanted this monkey head to face us instead of looking off to the side there? Perhaps the most common way is with your object selected, tab into edit mode and rotate or transform the object so it aligns the way you want. Another way is to select the curve, tab into edit mode and find mean tilt. This value affects the tilt of the object along the curve, so rotating it will effectively rotate your object. Note that once the object's location moves beyond the edge of the curve, it continues in the direction of the normal of the curve's endpoints. Here's another arrayed object using a curve modifier. Rotating the object in edit mode rotates it around the curve, and as we saw before, you can also twist the curve to rotate the object. Twisting a curve is specific to each vertex, meaning you can select specific vertices and twist them in one direction, and select other vertices and twist them in a different direction. And that's it for my curve modifier tips. Now for some rigid body tips. Rigid body tip number one, objects falling through other objects. 
Make sure rigid body effects have been applied to both objects. The falling object should be set to active, and the static object, the object the falling object collides with, should be set to passive. If your objects still pass through each other, apply scale transformations by selecting all objects involved in your rigid body simulation, hit Control A to bring up the Apply menu, and select Scale. Lastly, check the dimensions of your objects. Extremely small dimensions, as shown here, may result in unexpected interactions. You might see unusual physics behavior or active objects passing through passive objects. The solution is to scale up your objects and then apply that transformation. Tip number two, using arrays in rigid body simulations. This conveyor belt is just an array with a curve modifier applied. Even when observing all the tips we just covered, the objects pass through the belt. Very disappointing. To fix this, in the rigid body settings, ensure the arrayed object's shape is set to convex hull and the source is set to final. Convex hull basically wraps the object in plastic wrap. It ignores cavities and holes, resulting in a shape that's easier for the simulation to handle. Setting the source to base uses the base mesh without accounting for any deformations or modifiers. Setting the source to deform takes into account any deforming modifiers or shape keys. And final takes into account all modifiers, including the array modifier. Blender's primitive collision shapes are great for memory and simulation performance and should be used when they either match the object shape well enough or yield the desired animation results. They are calculated to fit within the object's bounding box, centered on the object's origin point. Here are some common collision primitives applied to the same object. The mesh option uses your actual mesh, which is most accurate, but can be memory intensive for high vertex count meshes. Convex hull provides a way to retain the shape of your mesh with fewer vertices, which is very simulation friendly. Rigid body tip number three, using animated arrays. Since our conveyor belt is modified with a curve, we can easily animate it along the curve by keyframing its movement along the x-axis. With the object selected, hit I and select location to create a keyframe where your cursor is on the timeline. Then move your timeline cursor to another position, adjust the x location of the object, and hit I and select location again to add another location keyframe. When we hit play, we see the belt is now animated, but the rigid body objects are not responding to the conveyor belt's movement. To fix this, we have to change a few things. First, let's apply the array modifier. Then, in the conveyor belt's rigid body settings, change the collision shape to mesh and set the source to deform. Next, Enable deforming, which accounts for the object's deformations over time. Lastly, check animation to allow the rigid body simulation objects to be affected by the conveyor belt's animation. If you still get unexpected results, the issue is now likely to be associated with the collision shapes of one or more of your active rigid body objects. In this case, the culprit is our donut, which is using a cylinder collision primitive. Changing the collision shape to convex hull resolved the issues. Rigid body tip number four, gaps between collision objects. Now our objects collide properly and everything looks great, except when we look closely, there's a gap between our conveyor belt and the objects that are supposed to fall onto it. The biggest culprit of this is a convex hull collision shape. Since convex hull ignores cavities and holes, the shape used for the simulation has a flat surface here, which our falling objects collide with. The easy fix is to ensure that the collision shape is set to mesh. If your objects involved in the simulation don't have cavities or holes, this will likely not fix your problem. The next solution is to reduce or disable the collision margin on the affected objects. Collision margin is unchecked by default and only affects your simulation if enabled. When enabled, the simulation extends the boundary of the mesh that will affect collisions by the selected amount. These objects here are huge, 
so the default margin value has no visible effect on them. But if your objects are small enough, the default value might create a noticeable gap. To demonstrate, I'll increase the margin here to 0.3 meters. The solution here is simple. Reduce the collision margin or uncheck it and disable it. Rigid body tip number five, rigid body world settings. There are some values that can affect the performance and quality of your rigid body simulation. And these are found under scene settings, rigid body world. I'll just quickly go through what each of these values mean. The collection contains all the objects contained in your rigid body simulation. Basically any object with rigid body physics applied to them. The constraints contains all of the constraints used in this simulation. In this simulation here, we have none, so this is empty. Speed can increase or decrease the speed of the simulation. I have three separate versions here to show you what the speed looks like when it changes from one, two, and five. Split impulse tends to lower simulation stability. When enabled, it reduces extra velocity by limiting the force that separates objects on collision. Since this tends to lower object stability, it is recommended only when necessary. Increasing sub-steps per frame can improve simulation stability at the cost of memory. Too many steps can crash your system or generate erratic results. To demonstrate this, we have a ton of balls colliding with this conveyor belt and falling into this box. Notice the simulation looks fine with the default settings. Increasing sub-steps didn't crash my system, but it did result in increased interaction between the falling objects. Here, I'm showing the results of having sub-steps set to 10, 50, and 100. Increasing solver iterations can improve object stacking stability and physics interactions among many objects. These demos show the results of using 10, 50, and 100 solver iterations. Note that increasing sub-steps or solver iterations will increase your overall simulation time. Selecting Remove Rigid Body World will remove all rigid body settings, so use this only if you want to start with a clean slate. I hope these tips will demystify animating with rigid body or curves. If you found this useful, please like or subscribe, and take to the comments down below if you have a question or you just want to tell me how your day is going. I hope it's awesome. Keep blending.